And just like that, season 31 of The Ultimate Fighter is on to the finals. Welcome to After Tough. I am your man, Dean Thomas. Since this is the last After Tough show, we had to go big on this episode. I'll talk to the winner, Cody Gibson, and we have never before seen footage and everyone's favorite segment, the memes of the week. But that's not all we got. Season 27 coach and UFC Hall of Famer Daniel Cormier joining us later in the show. But right now, we have the man of the hour. He's right here in studio with us. Coach Iron Michael Chandler is here, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> in person, man. My Good man, to see you. my Good man, to see you. my man. So what's going on, my man? Dude, I'm just living the dream out here in Bristol. Um, excited to be here. It Just like you said, I can't believe it's over. 12 weeks that we did. I mean, we filmed it, you know, five, six months ago. Um, it's bittersweet. You know, I'm excited for to put an exclamation mark on the show tonight, obviously, um, and then in Boston this weekend. But it's, it's bittersweet. So you obviously lived it, and then you got a chance to watch the last episode. What did you think about the finale, the final? Man, you know, uh, it was great. It's obviously what I wanted. I wanted to see Cody go out there and, and get the win. Uh, now he is going to fight Brad Katona. Um, this weekend, so it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be fun. I knew Cody could get to the finals, especially after watching um, that first fight against Mondo, um, and then obviously going out there and finishing Rico tonight was uh, definitely a, a feather in his cap. And I'm excited to go out there and watch him fight this weekend. Now, before the season, you predicted that your team would win 75% of the fights. Now, with the Cody win, you have already cleared the 30 75% threshold. Was this season as easy as it looked for you? Definitely not easy. I mean, easy in the sense that we can look at the tallies and say, okay, we won, you know, almost all the quarterfinal fights went seven and one. Um, but from a physical, emotional standpoint, it was much harder than I thought. The moment I got there, or actually the moment I, you know, got the phone call that I was going to do this show, all I wanted to do was beat Connor. I wanted to beat him in every single aspect of, this, of the sport, the show, um, tough. And then I met my guys and realized, okay, I want to pour into these guys. I want to, I want to be a, a catalyst for change, a positive change in their life. So I put an immense amount of pressure on myself, an immense amount of work for those five weeks that we were there in Vegas. So it was definitely tough, um, but it was fulfilling nonetheless. No, I mean you was you was destroying him <laughs> all season. Some was would there, say. I, some would say. Now, was there ever a point, like any moment of the season, you were just like? I feel bad for this guy, man. This guy can't. I like. Hey, this guy can't buy a win. He got all the money in the world. Yeah. He can't buy a win. I did not actually. You know, it's hard. It's hard to feel for somebody who uh, who wins that much in life. Let's be honest. So, um, you know, we were just going to keep on stacking them up, just like I said on the show. Just when I got under his skin, and I was just, we were going to keep our mouth shut, and we we're going to keep on stacking up wins. And that was that was the ultimate goal because I never wanted to see Connor get a smile on his face because that meant one of my guys wasn't going to win their fight. So we wanted to go out there, put a nice big stand on every single fight team challenge did really well and now we got a couple guys in the finals well one of the good things about this show is that we always have bonus clips let's take a look at the first bonus clip that we have team mcgregor out to dinner together what was your like favorite walkout that you had yourself like your favorite in your career that you were like oh this one was the best just because yeah forever. new york New yeah, York? yeah, New York against Alvarez. No, New York was against Eddie Alvarez for the second belt. Avenged the Diaz loss. I was still the featherweight world champion. I was moving up to 155. Yeah, it was the first um, event in New York. The highest gate Madison Square Garden Madison Square Garden has ever had. And then I came out to uh, the Sinead O'Connor. Yeah, that was that But then it kicked into... Um, no, 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 not the biggie. 50 Cent, I run New York, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know that song? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was just, I oh, want something for me. I like the Sinead is, yeah. Sinead is dialed in, you're on a battlefield with an ax, yeah. you know, in the fog. Yeah. That's that's the way that, that makes you feel. But then when it kicks into like the biggie, 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 yeah, you can't you see? Or the, I run New York, and then you're just, you know, yeah. That's the vibe. It gives me chills. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, but it's just a different vibe. Like it's that intenseness and then it's that looseness. Yeah. yeah. And I like I like that mix. Of it. For me, yeah, I was actually sitting there at the Jones thing and I was thinking, I love my walkout. My walkout is the best walkout there is, I believe. Yeah. yeah. So he, <laughs> his favorite walkout was the Sinead O'Connor. Rest in peace. Yes. With Fifty Cent. I mean. 
I don't know what you come out to, but have you ever thought about coming out to that Celine Dion Kodak Black? <laughs> I have not, but no. <laughs> but there is no doubt that obviously Connor's Connor's walkout is very iconic, you know, and it's obviously it's very close to home for him with Sinead O'Connor. Uh, rest in peace, as you said. Uh, I walk out to NF. Uh, he's a rapper uh, from Michigan, and I started with a little bit of the intro to Paid My Dues and then straight into the search, and then we might even do a little remix for this next big fight. We'll see. But that's been my walkout now. Every fight in the UFC and probably my last 10 fights has been NF. You want me to tell you how old I am? Yeah, I do. <laughs> in my, and listen, in my day, we didn't even have walkout songs. We had to come oh out my. to the music that the UFC played for us. We didn't get a walkout Dude, song. I, hey, my, how times have changed. Now I, I actually got my my... Um, walkout song remix by the UFC. They actually added See You at the Top into it. So it was kind of cool. So we're going to do something cool. Probably going to go in the studio with Nate, uh, NF, and then uh, cut something together for this next fight. And let's take a look at the finish between Cody and Rico in their fight. Coach Chandler, can you walk us through this? Tell us what you see. Well, for Cody, it was an absolute dominant uh, performance on top. Once he got that takedown, he used that wrestling background, body triangle, throwing in the hooks. You see here, taking the back. There was a foreshadowing right before the arm triangle that he actually finished Rico with because he almost caught him with it just moments before and obviously finishes with the arm triangle up against the cage there to punch his ticket to the finals. And we got him here in Boston this weekend. Oh, and with that, we got him here. So let's welcome in the winner of this week, Cody Gibson. Cody, congratulations. Securing your spot in the finale. What did it feel like to get that win? Uh, it felt great. You know, we were a little worried with my knee injury and everything. Um, and so uh, when I was able to get to the fight to the ground, uh, 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 happy to get it to the ground. I knew I'd have an advantage once we got it there. So, uh, yeah, just capitalized, was able to beat him up a little bit. And, and in the week leading up into that fight, we had talked about uh, the opportunity for securing an arm triangle. Uh, we thought it would be there, and then sure enough, it was. And uh, we were able to. And that was the thing, too. I wanted to get him out of there in the first round because we saw in Rico's uh, quarterfinal fight that the guy's got heart, you know, and I. I remember having that thought uh, as I was kind of beating on him for a few minutes there um, that I didn't want to give him any any kind of hope, you know, and uh, let him go into his corner and regroup or anything like that. So um, the fact that I was able to do that um, and get him out of there was uh, definitely a, a little bit of a sigh of relief afterwards. Cody, I see a lot of stuff going on behind you. Where exactly are you at right now? I am at the host hotel for UFC Boston, and I'm signing uh, posters for uh, the event. We're trying to kind of double dip with uh, some of these responsibilities, but uh, we're making it work. This is, hey, baby, this is right where we wanted to be when we started this journey, man, and I'm so happy you're out there. Uh, but, Cody, you had, obviously, the beautiful arm triangle submission before the fight. You and I had talked uh, about po the possible submissions that you would use in the fight. Let's go ahead and take a look. I got a good dart, good anaconda, good guillotine. Well, you're, you're, I don't really see him shooting necessarily, but you're, yeah, you're defense, not your defense, your defense against Mondo. I think he thinks yeah. I'm going to strike with him. I think he thinks so too. Because he was like, it's going to be a banger. That's what he said yesterday. And I was like, I mean, I don't really want it to be. <laughs> nah, man. I've had enough bangers in my life, right? Because now there's no time Yeah, he's a, he's a character, you know. So that's what he thinks people want to hear. And also, that's what he, honestly, wouldn't you want a banger if you were him? You know? Yeah, he wants to have a striking you know? war. Yeah. Because that's his best opportunity. He ain't yeah. beating on that. No. Dude, you just go straight college wrestler, dude. Menlo College, dude. Stand up. Menlo College, baby, and you showed that Menlo College wrestling, man. You almost called your shot. We sat there and we talked about it. Uh, Cody, you were fighting through that knee injury. Obviously, we were a little bit uh, worried about it, but you did it. You, you absolutely unequivocally, unequivocally said there was no way you weren't going to fight. How difficult was it for you to be ready to perform mentally as well as physically? Well, it was just hard because we were trying to think about, you know, as you know, Coach, we were trying to, you know, how could I kind of – protect my knee uh in the stand-up exchanges uh so i kind of changed my stance up for the fight and kind of had a bladed boxing stance my toe pointed in so because the thing i wanted to avoid was inside leg kicks where the mcl was injured so and 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 i kind of assumed that rico was going to try to attack the outside of the leg because that's what i would do too if i saw a guy standing like that you, know, you can't really check a kick with your your toe pointed in like a boxer 
Um, so I kind of was prepared to eat some leg kicks, but, uh, um, yeah, you know, I, luckily I was able to get the fight to the ground and, uh, I knew I'd have a significant advantage once we got it there, you know, from collegiate wrestling to 15 years of jujitsu. I knew, uh, and I'm long and lengthy for the weight class. Once I strap on that body triangle, um, it's hard to get out, you know, and that's something I've actually taken from the main event this week in Aljamain Sterling. I've talked to him about it. Uh, he calls it a human backpack, but me and him are similarly sized, and uh, we try to both employ that kind of, if we can get our get get the back, you know, it's, it's going to be a long night for anybody we fight. Yeah, and that was definitely going to be part of our game plan. Obviously, we saw as you as you alluded to Rico's first fight, he was having trouble on the ground, but if he got to the second round, he might have been a problem. But obviously, you went out there and got the job done, man. And I can't wait to see you in a couple of days out there in Boston. I'm excited, man. It's been uh, it's been great to have a long training camp. I, you know, a lot of times fighters don't have this long to prepare for a fight. So I took advantage of it. I had all summer to train full time, no, no class, no teaching this summer. Uh, so we were able to just dedicate ourselves and put our put our head down and go to work and uh, excited to go out and uh, and kind of cash in the chips, so to speak. Cody, before we let you go. So we know who you're going to be fighting this weekend in Boston. We also know that you don't seem to be very fond of your opponent, Brad Katona. Man, can you kind of shed some light on your relationship with Brad? Yes. I tried to give Brad the benefit of the doubt early on in the show. Um, and just, you know, I didn't, it didn't bother me that he was a little bit of an odd guy. Um, I know I got, I got buddies who are odd guys, but uh, as, the th as the season progressed and the weeks kind of, the days and the weeks passed by, um, there were just things he did that upset me, uh, selfish things. Um, he was really good at playing the game. Uh, he knew he had been on the show, you know, so he was able to kind of maneuver his way into uh, getting some of the uh, accommodations that he was able to get and uh, little things that you do um, that kind of got under my skin over time, you know. Um, and finally, it all kind of boiled, boiled over that last day. Uh, right before those semifinal fights, and we kind of had a little altercation. Mike was sitting right there, uh, but uh, pretty awkward probably for you. But, uh, yeah, uh, it doesn't really matter, though, at the end of the day. I mean, I studied his body. I studied his movement. We looked at things we can exploit, and uh, I'm not going to take any – you know, I've, I've been fighting for 15 years, so I've learned the lesson that you can't really take too much emotion into a fight. Um, now, with that said, I'm not going to have any any – any problems punching Brad Katona in the face on Saturday night, but uh, yeah, I'm not going to be, you know, I don't let my emotions kind of dictate, you know, how I'm going to fight or anything like that, but uh, I'm excited, man. I'm, I'm excited to go out, put a stamp on this thing, and uh, and be back where I should have been a long time ago, which is back amongst uh, the best fighters in the world. Yes, sir, man. You absolutely punched your ticket to Boston this weekend, and you get to punch Brad Katona in the face. I do remember it was very, very awkward watching you and listening to you and Brad about to get into a fist fight in the kitchen. But, hey, man, tell us, what are you expecting to happen this weekend? I know, I know what we're expecting. You and I talked last night, but give the fans at home uh, a little bit of uh, what your, your thought process and how you think you're going to go out there and beat Brad Katona. Uh, I mean, I, I do. I will say that I, I, I gained some respect for Brad in his semifinals fight. He, he came out and fought Timmer, and uh, he wasn't able to just hold him. Uh, he had to. He was forced to fight, and he did. He bit down on his mouthpiece, and he fought. And uh, I actually thought he lost that fight in the semifinals. It was close, um, but um, I, I have a feeling uh, after the first or second exchange in, in the center of that octagon, he's gonna try to put me against the cage, try to hold me, try to kill the time on the clock. So that's what I've been working on is just being diligent about taking the center of the cage, moving forward. I'm a pressure fighter, so I'm going to put the pressure on him early and often. And, uh, yeah, man, I'm excited. I, I think uh, if I can get him to get in the fire with me one or two times, I think I'm going to get him out of there. I'm going to land something clean, and uh, I'm going to get him out of there. That's what I'm envisioning in my head at least. Well, Cody, we are definitely looking forward to it. I'm going to be out there. Your coach, Mike, is going to be out there. Best of luck to you, man. You did a fantastic job all season. We're looking forward to it. Best of luck in the finale, man. Have a good one. Hey, guys. Thanks, thanks for having Cody. me. Love you, bro. I'll see you. See you. So we just saw the tense face-off between Cody and Brad, but, Michael, you had your own face-off at the end of the episode. 
this is the biggest comeback in sports history. You know, what I've came through, what I've attained. I'm very excited for it, and I'm very confident for it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That's what you think. Yeah, that was perfect. Good job. Oh, Thanks, great, great, great. Yeah. I look forward to the fight. Really, I can't wait. I wish it was right now. <laughs> <laughs> right here on the bloody yeah, canvas. I want the biggest, the baddest, and best Connor that we could possibly see. I want to compete against that guy on the biggest stage and the brightest lights. Ton of respect for Connor, what he's done in his entire career, what he's done for the sport. But ultimately, he's trying to take something from me when we step inside the octagon. I think it's going to be the biggest fight that we've seen in a very long time. Now, just on Saturday, Conor McGregor said that he wants to return in December against you. And Dana White confirmed last week that you are Conor's next fight. Uh, can you break any news? Like, wait, like, what do you got for him? Like, uh, come on, man. man like, you know, up and down. Come on, man. Know, what you got? I know. The problem is this is such a big fight. Like, people want me to come back, obviously. People definitely want him to come back after an injury like he has had, touting the greatest comeback in combat sports history. So people want answers. But I don't have any answers for you. But, yes, we do have a couple answers. I am Connor's next opponent. He wants to fight by the end of the year. Will that happen? We don't know. If I had it my way, I would have fought him yesterday. Um, I'm ready. You guys see me. I'm always training. Um, but hopefully we get some news sometime soon. Uh, either way, it was awesome to get up in his face again. Because in that moment, the tough show was finally over. It wasn't about the guys anymore. And then it was that moment where it was like, okay, oh, yeah, you and I are fighting again. Because we were so focused on our other, you know, our fighters and on our team. So I can't wait to go out there and smash this dude in the first two rounds. So what's it been like having so much talk about this fight and about it actually happening? And any prediction, like, if you do fight him, like, what are your predictions on what's going to happen? Man, I will say it's, it's definitely been interesting because I've never had this much. You know, as you know, as a fighter, most of the time you got your two months till you're leading up to a fight. A fight gets announced. Everything starts moving forward. Then the camera crews start coming out, the countdowns, the interviews. This has been so back and forth and so many moments like this where it's like, hey, you're on camera here in sport, at Sports Center or, or tough, after, tough talk, after tough, blah, blah, blah. When are y'all fighting? And my answer always is, well, y'all, I don't know. So I've never had this many interviews or talking to people behind closed doors and not been able to give them a concrete answer of when we're fighting. But what I will say is, like I said, I'm Connor's next opponent. He is my next opponent. And when we do fight, I think I finish him within the first two rounds of that fight. Uh, and then I win the title uh, six or eight months later. Hold on. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I just... Is that Dana? I just got word. Connor just posted a video about the upcoming fight. Let's take a look at it. Okay. Michael Chandler. You're right. You better be training. Me bringing in me new head coach. Pah! That's right. Stephen A. Smith is inside of the Pentagon. Y'all didn't know I was a world-renowned trainer extraordinaire. That's right. And with my training, Conor McGregor will be indomitable. So without further ado, let's get started. All right, now. Let's go. Let's go. Jab. Come on now, Jab. Your technique is atrocious. How the hell did you win a world championship? Let's see some head movement. <laughs> speed drill, speed drill. Hey, hey, first of all, what a p phenomenal pickup from the coaching staff for Stephen A. Smith. Got awesome hands, a definite expert in Pentagon fighting. And number two, where the heck was that Pentagon? That, where were you that guys training? That's that Rise of the Warrior. That's that Rise of the Warrior where right were they there. they training at? Pierce. <laughs> In the <Yeah>. field. <laughs> I'm saying, though, but how scared are you watching that training footage, man? I mean, he looked he looked like he was getting it in. Dude, well, hey, everybody knows Stephen A's hands are second to none. The only thing he can do better is lose his breath while he's speaking <laughs> on camera. <laughs> I love it. But on a serious note, Mike, what do you think will be the lasting memory of your time on The Ultimate Fighter as a coach? Man, it's a good question, and I think it's... I think it's the memories that we made, but the memories that will be in transit for the next decades, man. You know, just like I said, I, I spoke to Cody this week, spoke to uh, Kurt this week, spoke to Austin this week. Obviously, those guys are fighting this weekend, so they are fresh in everybody's mind and they're going to compete. But, man, I made some amazing friendships, uh, relationships. I hope these guys look at me as a catalyst for change, a catalyst for, for positivity and happiness and joy 
in their current life and in their future. And hopefully I helped become, help them become better fighters, better men, better fathers, husbands. Um, so man, just having that opportunity to spend that time with these guys was something I will never, ever forget. So it was an awesome experience and it was here on ESPN every single week for 12 weeks. So it was so much fun. Speaking to someone with lasting memories on The Ultimate Fighter, we have another Tough Coach alum with us in studio today. One of the baddest, in my opinion, the baddest light heavyweight champion of all time, yeah, yeah. Daniel Cormier. I love coaching. I enjoy uh, trying to help and really just play a part in these guys' journey uh, to become The Ultimate Fighter. Guys, look in real quick. I want to make these positions as uncomfortable as I can. Right? We may not submit them, but it's just constant pain just little nasty it's a fight right so when you pull him wrench his freaking neck now let's welcome in the ufc hall of famer and season 27 coach daniel cormier <laughs> on the oh, after hey. oh, you know what it is my man now i just asked michael about any lasting memories on being on the ultimate fighter do you have any as a coach? Yeah, absolutely, right? It was just playing a part in these kids' journey. And I think it's because of the wrestling is why we took to coaching so effectively, why we were so invested in these kids. I brought my entire coaching staff. I would spar the kids. I would wrestle the kids. We did everything to try to prepare them the best that we could for them to find success on the, on the show. There's Brad Katona I'm sparring with right there. He was on Team Chandler uh, this season. Great kid. And a phenomenal fighter, but it was all, uh, everything involved with the show. The time spent, the time in the training room, and really just helping these kids try to accomplish something bigger than they ever thought that he could. So how did you think Mike did as a coach? I thought he did pretty good. I mean, when you, good. Listen, Come when on, you man. win, <laughs> look, <laughs> on, let me tell you something. When okay. you win that many fights, you're obviously doing something right. One of the issues was when I was fighting or on the Ultimate Fighter, we were winning the fights. But I was training them so hard, they all kept getting hurt. So it was like I was winning but getting dudes hurt. Mike was able to win but keep everybody healthy and still continue to have these guys improving. He got them to buy into the system. He got them to listen, learn. And what I think he did was even harder than what I did because he had guys that had already been to the show, guys that if you're not careful, they think to themselves, hey, I'm as good as anybody in the world right now. So his job was a little harder. I thought he did a great job. Good for you, Mike. I'll take okay, that. Okay, I'll take that. There it goes. But listen, I'm glad that you guys are here because it is now time for my favorite part of the show, memes of the week. Because normally I'll be here by myself laughing and having a good time by myself, but now I got somebody here to kick it. Memes of the week. Look. Oh. Giving CPR to a dude was thank breath. Is that how you do it, Mike? I, I'm pretty sure that's how you do it. <laughs> Look yeah, at Mike. As far away as you can. Yeah, you gotta I don't, be as far away. What happened here? What happened here? How <laughs> wrestlers act when they, they win using jujitsu? That's the truth. true. It's true. Hey, every right? time you get a submission, yeah, you start like, celebrating. You be like, yeah. You act like you the best. I'm a state. You act like you the best. You start taking your wrestling coach for the submission. Nicely oh. reminding your accountant that you only made $600 all year. Hey, yeah. man, listen, you better hey. not make sure y'all. <laughs> you grab him by the neck a little <laughs> bit, hold on to him tight, like scare him a little hey, bit, that, but not too much. Yeah. That was after the team switch, too. I gave him a last Yeah, is that what that was? <laughs> hey, you're on my, ish, you my ish list, but I still love you, though. Michael Chandler. John Jones' big toe fighting to stay on his foot. Have you ever <laughs> seen his big toe, man? That was nasty, bro. Yeah. <laughs> that was nasty. <laughs> Yeah. I thought it was over. That was no way he was going to be able to continue <laughs> fighting. Hey, Chell would have took that victory and took it all the way to the mountaintop, too. Sure would have. Yeah, sure would have. Aljamain Sterling, Aljamain Sterling's coach. I promise I will not stand <laughs> and bang this one. Of He's making that agreement. I, Al Jermaine is not standing and banging this weekend. I mean, I don't think it's – I, I don't know if it's that simple. It's not but that I simple. But I do believe that Al Jermaine would be in the fit from – making sure this fight is fought on the ground. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. What we got here? Okay. Pretending to be Harry Potter, making a potion so Cody doesn't make it to the finals. <laughs> hey, this is hey. The, that's when he just got done saying, why does everybody pick on me? I yeah. can tell you why, Brad. I can tell you why everybody picks <laughs> on me. No, no, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let me take that little hey, thing on so his head, So my boy Brad's on switch teams. Now Michael Chandler's not pulling his punches no more. Right? <laughs> no, no, okay. Dude, he okay, ain't Mike. on Team Chandler anymore. I can tell you how I really feel, Brad. Oh, Here. yeah. Okay. Oh. DC, Bro. when Alan Joban said we're going to break the record for the most first-round fight night finishes. Doug, did y'all see that last weekend? Oh, Do we yeah, had seven fights, seven finishes, one yeah. fight away from breaking the all-time record for first-round finishes. 
stupid Joe Van goes, Karen goes, hey, we have one fight from breaking the Joe, Joe Van. Oh, we're definitely breaking the record. Then next thing you know, decision, decision, decision. <laughs> stupid Allen <laughs> Joe Van, man. Nah, he messed jinxed up. Stupid Allen Joe Van, dog. Joe Van jinxed, the Joe he Van jinxed, jinxed man. it, dog. Joe Van, <laughs> stupid. What is good looks? Yeah. Hey, Joe Van. Yeah. <laughs> Now let's take a look at the move of the fight. Cody was able to secure a beautiful arm triangle in the first round against Rico. And now we have DC and coach Michael Chandler to demonstrate how Cody was able to secure the win. All right. All right, let's take a quick look. So the biggest thing that, that we're doing here is you have the carotid arteries on both sides of the neck. So my bicep on this side is gonna choke the carotid artery on his right side, and I'm using his shoulder to choke the other one. So I'm gonna get deep here, lock my hands, and then bring my hips. Yep, and drop his chest, right? The moment you start to drop your chest, the choke goes, Dean will go. What was very interesting about the way Cody did it, though, he still had a leg in. He was still partially mounted. So it tells you how much power he was able to generate from this position. He had the arm triangle. You could immediately see him try to get himself where he got his body between his opponent in the cage. And the moment he did that, he dropped his right hip. As he dropped his right hip, the shoulder pressure starts to go into the neck. Opponent had no choice but to tap. But ultimately, when you're trying to arm triangle, as Michael said, in the technical terms, the carotid artery here, carotid artery there, and all that other stuff. You take the arm triangle, you get off to the side, you don't squeeze. When you squeeze, it's a problem. You allow for your shoulder pressure and all your weight going down towards the mat to allow you to get that choke, right, Dino? You felt the difference when he started to drop that chest? I felt the difference, and I'm suing. He hurt me. <laughs> Rip is Let's get that kind of McGregor money, yeah. though. Let's hey, 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 get that kind of McGregor money, Dino. First, and you guys can sue me. <laughs> All right, let's take a quick look at the tail of the tape for the Bantamweight finale between Brad Katona and Cody Gibson. Now, Cody has a significant advantage in height and reach, but we know that Brad won't be backing down from anyone. DC, you were Brad's coach when he won season 27. Now, what are your thoughts on Brad potentially becoming the first two-time Ultimate Fighter winner? You know, he has an opportunity. You know, I know that the kid is a bit... Different. That's how I always try to describe Brad. He's different because it seems as though he's in there for only Brad Katona. But I think that you kind of have to. He understands what's at stake here inside the octagon. That's why he operates in the way that he does. But one thing you will never question is Brad Katona's ability to prepare himself. And I believe in his preparation is why he finally finds success. If there's a kid that can win this thing twice, that has the mental makeup to go through this twice, it's Brad Catone. I love that you bring up preparation because I just talked to Cody Gibson last night, who most people should know by now, he's a school teacher. He actually started school this week. I talked to him last night. He had just gotten done with school and then training. He just said he put in a 13-week training camp, which is longer than he ever has in his entire life. Normally, he's only gotten four-week camps, six-week camps. So Cody Gibson, I have to admit, I had my doubts at the very beginning. His mindset, he was very quiet. He was a little bit reserved. Didn't seem like he believed in himself. But watching him go out there and compete, how mean this guy is, how much passion he fights with. I think Cody Gibson goes out there, and it's not just because he's on Team Chandler. I think Cody <laughs> Gibson goes out there. He's Whoa. the bigger body, more power, better wrestling. I think he's better everywhere, and he's got something to prove and absolutely dislikes Brad Katona with a passion. I know. So, for you, how satisfying is it going to be watching Cody beat up uh, that old Benedict Arnold. <laughs> oh. Yo, exactly. Hey, it's going to be satisfying. I'm just listen. kidding. I'm just kidding, no. Brad. I, okay, maybe no. I'm not. Yeah, no, <laughs> get hey, listen, we get it. It's, it's one of those things now where I can talk about Brad because he's not on Team Chandler anymore. And, yes, he was somewhat of an outcast on Team he Chandler. Was, but he was selfish. Because, but he, he did. Did. Because selfish, he was selfish. But, but, bro, he's selfish because he has to. Yes. Got, you have In to that be. situation, right, especially when you've been there before, your opportunity was taken away. Not taken away. You lost it. You lost the chance to stay in the biggest organization in the world to fight. You got to win your way back on the way you got there the first time. It's difficult. Do what works it's for daunting. you. It's daunting. So you got to go out there and do what works for you and what's the best chance for you to ultimately accomplish your goals. Hey, this is a selfish game. I get that. But let's move on to the lightweight matchup between Austin Hubbard and Kurt Hollibaugh. Now, Kurt has a finish in 16 of the 19 pro fights that he's had. 
Both of these fighters were on your team, Michael, so you know them very well. Now, how anxious are you to watch this fight? It's going to be tough. You know, you guys saw me wincing uh, cage side watching Hollaball versus Knight. You know the sweat. Yeah, it was back, tough, back man. You know, it's one of those things where I don't want either of them to lose. I don't want I, – and I want both of them to win, but it's just not our game that we play. So, it's going to be tough. I will obviously be very silent there watching. I talked to both of those guys last night. I'll see them in Boston, give each of them some time and wish them both the best of luck. Um, but we'll not be obviously, you know, coaching at all on these guys. But man, they, they both have the ability to put it together. Both are very, very skilled fighters and great men, great leaders. So I'm excited to watch the fight. Well, you, you look like an old wrestling coach out there. Yeah, I was like, I had a Sharpie in my hand and I almost broke the Sharpie every single time I was squeezing it. <laughs> now, DC, now these guys were teammates. They had to spend the entire duration of the show in the house together. How do they put that aside and go out there and compete? I, I don't know if it's as big a deal as some people may think. You know, it's a different thing when you're spending the vast majority of your time in the gym for years with someone. I think the Gilbert Burns, Kamaru Usman situation. Times like that, that's hard. When you go into a house knowing this is your second opportunity, and you build a friendship over the course of six weeks, you got to let that go, right? You release that to go out in there and try to be, get what you went out there to get. And I truly believe that these two men, knowing that this is their opportunity, will let it go, especially Hubbard. Hubbard, right? I've called this fight before in the UFC. I've called Hollaboss fights in the UFC. I've seen these guys compete in the highest level, at the highest level. If they want that opportunity again, They've got to win. And as much as Michael wants to say, well, I hope both of them get the contract. <laughs> not how it works, Mike. <laughs> you know, it's not. It ain't all that's what I want. It Don't ain't mean, all that's sunshine and rainbows and unicorns, bro. I know. You're right. You, you, you hey, the good like thing unicorns is, are real. Yeah, the good, the good thing is, like you say, these guys spent all those weeks together every single day, some of them roommates and eating next to each other, breaking bread next to each other. But now they've had months and months and months away from them to put that friendship aside. Those guys, that friend that he had on Team Chandler, each of them, is now a distant memory. Now it's two arms and two legs it's another human being and you are trying to take what I what I what it, I want to get through it means more to Mike as the coach right I, the I guy that, that was guiding them to try to put them in position but for the athletes they recognize what they have to do I, I said this earlier when I fought Miocic the night before they crowned the ultimate fighter I was able to get away from it because I had something so big on my own plate right on the eve of when they were fighting or the day after. So I, I was done. Like, my job was pretty much done. I watched it. I was happy when Brad won. I was happy when uh, I think Bryce might have won or lost. I don't know. I don't even remember. <laughs> but it's like I, I was able to release it. But Michael is still locked into it because he doesn't have anything to look forward to just yet. Well, him and we Kyle don't were know, fighting. Hopefully, if him and Kyle were fighting that. the next day, <laughs> yeah, 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 he would be like, ah, sure. yeah, that's a much sure. different sure. scenario. Yeah. I mean, and obviously for me, I'm just happy to be there in Boston this weekend. It's going to be fun to watch. Well, I tell you what, I think it's going to be a great type. So make sure you check out the finale of the Ultimate Fighter this weekend at UFC 292. The prelims get kicked off with Brad Katona and Cody Gibson followed by Kurt Hollaball and Austin Hubbard. The prelims start at 8 p.m. Eastern and will be on ESPN as well as ESPN+. But the main event of the UFC 292 is the Bantamweight banger between my boy Aljamain Sterling and Sugar Sean O'Malley. DC, Aljamain going for his fourth title defense. How does he get it done? He's got to be Aljo. He's got to, he really just has to be him. And Aljo's unique. Right? He's a unique guy to fight. He's long. He's a bit awkward. He's got to be uniquely Al Jermaine Sterling. He's got to take shots from weird angles. He's got to push him against the octagon and be like a dog on the bone. When the first takedown fails, shoot again. He's got to fight him in the same way he fought Henry Cejudo, where he was just all over him, dragging on him and reminding him that he's the man. He's the champ. You know, and we speak about Al Jermaine Sterling getting the four title defense. It's time to put all that aside a bit and go, we got to talk about the greatest Bantamweight of all time. A guy that has won more fights in Bantamweight history than anyone. A guy that has the longest win streak in Bantamweight history going right now. A guy that's tied for the most Bantamweight title defenses in the history of the UFC. 
It's time to respect Aljo. But if Aljo wants to extend that and then move up to 145 in a fairy tale manner, he's got to be uniquely Aljamain Sterling. Well, I love Aljo and I love his chances. And it's, to me, it's no doubt that he's the greatest bantamweight ever. But he's taking on the most popular bantamweight of all time, Sugar Sean O'Malley. So, Mike, I'm going to come to you. How does he get it done? Man, I think he just needs to be exactly who Sean O'Malley has been. We, we, DC and I talked about this earlier. I think Sean O'Malley believes in Sean O'Malley more than anybody believes in Sean O'Malley in the entire world. And that is the most important piece of this puzzle. Puzzled. Sean O'Malley being unapologetically exactly who he, who he is, braggadocious at time, stunting on people at times inside the octagon, outside the octagon with the pink Lambos and the pink hair. He believes that he is the number one guy in the world, and he believes that this is the best opportunity of his lifetime. And I do believe if Al Jermaine Sterling can't take down Sean O'Malley and make it kind of that grimy up against the cage and on the floor kind of fight, Sean O'Malley is going to use that distance and keep pot shotting him all night long. I can't wait, man. It's such an <laughs> exciting fight, man. I love the band and weight division, but we have some questions that were submitted to both of you guys, some fan questions. Hmm, what do we have here? <laughs> From the Twitter, from the X-verse. Yes, from, uh, so this was a question from Menace and the Man Show. This is for you, DC. Yes, sir. Going into a fight, knowing it's your last, does it hurt or help you? And how did you feel going into your last fight? I think both a little bit, but I think it hurts because you start looking to what's next, right? I was very open about Miocic and I's fight, the third one being my final fight, so... It does hurt a little bit, but the mentality is to still go and win. But as I've told people time and time again, you recognize when the doors are kind of closing. You know you're not the same guy from a couple years ago when you're in there, right? No. So no matter what your mind tells you, because the champion never loses that mind or that spirit. What they lose is the ability to do it because the body doesn't respond in the same way. And I, I recognize that early in that fight. Granted, we had a good fight, right? 48, 47, 48, 47, 49, 46. It was a great fight, but it wasn't uh, it, it was over, and I knew it. Now I got one for you, Mike. Okay, this one is from Jose Parasquai12. He says, or he, he wants to know, when you beat Conor McGregor, what's your next move? Man, it's going to be tough. Uh, you know, obviously I like to focus on the task at hand. What is the most important thing in my life, in my professional career, that is beating Conor McGregor whenever that fight happens. Now, I think beating Connor in the emphatic finish, finishing way that I'm going to in, the, in a dominant fashion, you know I'm always in that talks for, hey, who could be in that number one contender spot? Um, you know, obviously I make, no, uh, I make no concessions. I want to win the UFC world title. I think beating Connor puts me right into that mix where maybe I'm one fight away. Um, but we'll see. Beat up Connor so badly that he wants a rematch. Maybe we'll rematch. Maybe we'll be on Tough 32. We don't know against each other. This boy right here likes to miss. Fight He's the boy right here trying to back him. He likes to back himself into that money. Hey, 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 who wouldn't want to see me rematch Charles or Gaethje for that hey, you title. don't need to talk about Justin Gaethje because remember what Dustin Poirier told you? What? Sit your ass down. <laughs> why Dustin Poirier hate me so much, man? Dustin, I don't why know you why, hate me so much, I man? Don't know why, I don't know why he hates you so much. Like, I find you to be a really good guy. Yeah, good dude. Dustin man. don't like you. Maybe someday we'll be friends when we're done competing, but not Hey, Justin now, Gaethje man. was acting like that with him, too, man. One time we were on a way in show, Justin Gaethje said, look at him with his stupid face. <laughs> He said, something about your face, I just want to punch it. I said, <laughs> I, I said, you know what? That'll be fun, man. Yeah, you got an opportunity to do it. And it was awesome. Oh, my year. goodness. Well, listen, fellas, man, it's been amazing having you guys <laughs> on. DC, I'll see you on the Way in Show and the broadcast this weekend. And, Mike, we hope to see you later in the Octagon this year. I can't believe we are at the final episode of Tough 31. The Ultimate Fighter is a unique experience. I know, I've been through it, season four. Then I was back when film was all grainy and we wore these big old basketball looking shorts and Dana White, he looked more like Charlie Brown than Mr. Clean. But the intention of the show is still the same. Are you a fucking fighter? 
You see, MMA is flooded with posers. Some of y'all ain't real fighters. Y'all just want to be famous and you want to be cool and beat people up on TV and get all the girls. <laughs> but that's not how it works. You see, real fighters are built different. They crave challenges and embrace suffering in order to prove they are the best fighters in the world. And those qualities are not developed on The Ultimate Fighter. They are revealed and intensified. And if your heart pumps Kool-Aid, that too will be revealed and intensified. Basically, if you a you a And it should be no surprise that fighters like Michael Bisping, Kamaru Usman, Matt Serra can win the Ultimate Fighter and go on to become UFC champions because they are abundantly rich in that warrior spirit. Now, Conor McGregor, we know that you're rich and famous. We know that you have Lamborghinis and yachts, and we know that you were a brilliant martial artist. But the hood doesn't care. We want to know, are you a fighter? Because Michael Chandler is waiting. Or are you going to leave him hanging like a pair of boxing gloves on a Puerto Rican's rearview mirror? Because I have a hard time believing that the notorious will do nothing. I'm Dean Thomas, and I'm not here to give you a problem. I'm just here to give you some tough love.